Good evening and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. My name is Bhante Sudasso and this is the weekly monk chat session, an opportunity to ask questions related to Buddhism and possibly receive some responses. So I'll start with paying homage to the Buddha and then I'll go through whatever questions are typed into the comments window. Uh, and when the flow of questions stops, then the monk chat session will stop. So if you want us to keep going, then keep asking questions. So I'll start with homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang namang sangang namasami. Okay, hello to the people who have checked in online so far. Hello to Dharmika, Maria, Gita, Rick. Yankee and everyone else who's watching. And I see one question so far. So Dharmika says, if the sleep is full of more or less dreams, is it a good sleep? Can the quality of sleep indicate the quality of Dhamma practice? So I would be hesitant to use your sleep as a way of judging the effectiveness of your Dhamma practice. Uh, that said, generally speaking, as one's practice develops, then generally speaking, you will have fewer nightmares, so your sleep will be more peaceful. Um, a lot of people report having fewer dreams, but that's not necessarily um, either a good or a bad sign. Um, but what is pretty common is that people have fewer nightmares as their practice continues. So I haven't had nightmares in a very long time now, I think many years at this point. So uh, it's pretty normal that, that that nightmares disappear more or less entirely. Um, however, some people find they need less sleep. Uh, occasionally people find themselves sleeping more. Uh, it's relatively common that when your meditation practice is going very well, it's relatively common that you need less sleep than usual. Uh, particularly during meditation retreats, it's common to find your need for sleep dropping by anywhere from 25 to 50%. Um, so if you normally sleep eight hours, then during a meditation retreat, um, you might find that you only need five or six hours. That's very common. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not necessarily going to be the case. But during retreats, that can definitely happen. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't use your sleep quality as a way of judging your practice. The way you judge your practice is by a reduction in defilements and an increase in happiness. Uh, those are the, the main factors. And I see some more people checking in. Hello to Maria, Kim, Rob, Manol, Moraya, Luisa, Little Dreamer, Bumika, and Ulises. So Moraya has a question. Moraya says, recently I've been finding the teachings and meditation practices of some Mahayana Buddhist teachers very helpful. Can I practice Theravada and Mahayana without this leading to confusion? Generally speaking, yes. Yes, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, Mahayana teachings which you'll find are perfectly in harmony with Theravada practice. Um, and there are some you'll find which are just only really relevant to specific kinds of Mahayana practice and which may not be so relevant to you. But generally speaking, Mahayana Buddhism is based upon the same underlying principles as Theravada Buddhism, namely Four Noble Truths and the, and the Eightfold Path. So generally speaking, uh, the teachings and practices are going to be relevant. Uh, assuming that they're genuine Dhamma teachings, then they'll be relevant whether it's coming from Theravada or Mahayana. So I personally have found a lot of benefit from uh, both Theravada and Mahayana teachings and practices, though my own practice tends to be a bit more on the Theravada side. Little Dreamer asks, while both firmly rooted its Theravada practice and open to other Buddhist sects, have other big monastic figures of other Buddhist denominations, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and more, come in as guest speakers, teachers, and given their insights? Yes, many. Um, more so in the past than these days, uh, but historically we have had many teachers from 
um, different branches of uh, Buddhism, um, including Mahayana. Uh, so uh, especially Chan teachers, we've had many Chan teachers, uh, some Vajrayana teachers as well. Um, less so other branches of Mahayana. Uh, we did have a Pure Land teacher come a couple of times and um, some other of the um, less well-known Mahayana branches, but mostly Chan, mostly Chan, Chan teachers and some Vajrayana teachers. Yeah, again, as I was just saying, it's uh, ultimately as long as the teachings are based upon the Four Noble Truths and Noble Eightfold Path, then they tend to be pretty much cross-compatible. And Ulysses, uh, who was just here at the monastery earlier today, so hello again, says, when people do things or say things about me or related to me, it bothers me, and I usually carry those things. How can I make sure those things don't bother me? Well, one thing that's useful to do is to recognize that holding on to resentment is hurting you. Uh, it's kind of like squeezing a sharp object in your hand. Uh, the more tightly you squeeze, the more painful it is. The more you relax and let go, the less painful it is. It's exactly the same with resentment. The more tightly you hold on to resentment, the more your mind hurts. Uh, the more you relax and let go of the resentment, then the less the mind hurts. So paying attention to the suffering, the dukkha, created by holding on to resentment, holding on to a grudge. And then the mind will be more likely to let go of it. Um, another useful thing is to remember that uh, virtually every single person you meet in your life is mentally ill. Literally. The Buddha said as much. The Buddha said that um, except for awakened beings, everybody else in the world is mentally ill. All of them. Um, so that means literally everyone you meet is crazy. All of them. Including you, by the way. But literally everyone you meet is insane. Why are you expecting sane behavior from crazy people? So when other people do things that you find offensive or bothersome, well, recognize one, it's just a symptom of their insanity. All oh, those poor people, they're crazy and they're doing crazy things. That's really sad. Um, but also the fact that you're taking it personally and getting bothered by it is a symptom of your insanity. Because it's, it's crazy to be bothered by the behavior of crazy people. That's also crazy. So forgive the other people for their craziness, recognizing it's actually a symptom of their own suffering and confusion. Um, when they say and do hurtful things, it's because they don't understand reality. It's because they're confused. Uh, so forgive them that. Um, and then for yourself, when you see yourself holding on to suffering, well, forgive yourself. Because that's, that's, just, that's just a symptom of your own confusion. Now, that's just your own uh, craziness manifesting. Um, and uh, as I was talking earlier about mindfulness of the body, come back to mindfulness of the body. Uh, focus on the feeling of your feet against the ground. Take a few deep breaths and focus on the feeling of the air flowing in and out of your lungs. Just focus on the feeling of the um, clothing against your skin, the warmth of your body, the heaviness of your body. Just come back to focusing on the sensation of your body um, and let those, those thoughts of resentment fade away. Bring up a little smile. Get back to your life with a, a clear mind, a sense of a serenity and groundedness. Okay, we have some more questions here. Little Dreamer asks, architectural questions. How has the monastery changed over the years since being home to Catholic monastic order in the past? Um, any significant renovations done? Well, uh, there used to be some Catholic statues here. So statues of Mother Mary, of uh, Jesus, of St. Augustine, a couple of uh, statues of angels, uh, and we gave those to a Catholic monastery that's close by, so of a different order, but, uh, well, actually, no, that's not true. Um, different branch of the same order. So we gave them the statues. They were very happy about that. Um, 
But in terms of major structural changes, actually, we haven't done anything major yet. Uh, we do have plans to eventually turn the garage into a big meditation hall, um, but that's not happening anytime soon. Um, yeah, otherwise, it's, it's actually not dramatically different from how it used to be. Uh, it's actually one of the perks of um, taking over a monastery is that we didn't actually have to do that much to keep using it as a monastery. Little Dreamer also asks, is there a big bell that is rung for a certain purpose or something else? I don't really know what you're asking. We do have bells, but they're mostly on the smaller side. And we do use bells for certain purposes, but I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Okay, and Aparna asks, advice for someone who is non-Buddhist, close to death to ensure good rebirth, person is kind and generous. I was thinking asking them to recollect virtue and generosity closer to moment of death. Yeah, that's good advice. And they don't need to wait until they're closer to the moment of death, they can start right away. So yeah, encouraging them to recollect their own kindness and generosity. Um, and also, um, it's a bit harder when somebody is not Buddhist. If they believe in rebirth, then you can encourage them to form the wish to uh, be reborn in conditions good for spiritual practice. Um, if they don't believe in rebirth, then you can't really say that to them because it's not really relevant. You could say it. It just might not be applicable to them. But the advice you already have is good, but there's no need to wait until they're closer to death. Uh, we should all be recollecting our virtue and generosity, no matter how close or far we are from death. And Aparna asks, are there any in-person retreats planned for this year? Yes, every day. Every day is an in-person retreat if you're at the monastery. So if you want to come and spend a few days at the monastery, you can send in a request. And Aparna says, thoughts of resentment fade away when I'm away from the person, but as soon as I see the person, I get so irritated and hurt again, and I lose my mindfulness. So when you know that you're going to be going into the presence of the this particular person, take a minute to bring up very strong metta in your mind. Build up a lot of loving kindness in your mind. Um, Focus on your body, build up mindfulness of the body, take a few deep breaths, really focus on establishing a, a peaceful and loving uh, heart before you go into that person's presence. And that will make it easier for you to keep your mind from slipping into negativity when you see them. Um, another thing which helps is to deliberately do kind things for the person. Uh, that also will help to change your attitude towards them. Deliberately do acts of kindness and generosity towards them. And Niranjan says, when a person understands Four Noble Truths verbally, is he can ordination being Buddha? I, I don't understand your question, Niranjan. Maybe if you can try rephrasing your question, I'll see if I can, if I can do better. So Moriah says, mindfulness seems to be defined and practiced in different ways. And I found there to be disagreements about what mindfulness really is. Do you have an explanation as to why this is? Yes, because the world is full of delusional people. That is why. So there is the Buddha's definitions of mindfulness, which you find in the suttas, and then there's everything else. So if you want to know what mindfulness is in a Buddha sense, then read the suttas, and you'll see what the Buddha had to say about mindfulness. And then you'll know when people are saying their own things, you'll know whether or not it lines up with the Buddha's own teachings on mindfulness. And there are a lot of people these days who say a lot of things which are not in accordance with the Buddha's teachings. Um, there's many people who call themselves Buddhist teachers, and yet what they're teaching is not in accordance with the Buddha's teachings. So if you want to know the difference, then you need to read the suttas. Uh, so you can get a better sense of what the Buddha himself was teaching. Um, and then you'll have an easier time figuring out who's teaching in line with the Dhamma and who's teaching something else. 
there's an added layer of confusion these days in that the word mindfulness these days is used quite heavily in non-Buddhist context by non-Buddhist people. Um, and often it's used to mean something a bit different from what Buddhists mean. And that also has then bled back into Buddhist circles where then there started to be Buddhist people who are using the word mindfulness in a non-Buddhist way. And they may not even realize that's what they're doing. They may not even realize that they've taken secular mindfulness concepts and written it over Buddhism. So that's another reason why there's some confusion. And it's because of the influence of secular mindfulness practices. And Rob says, the discussion around sleep reminded me how I feel so tired when I stay at monasteries because of the schedule. Are monastics allowed to nap if necessary? Is napping discouraged? So it depends on the monastery. It depends on the schedule. Uh, so in many monasteries, there is a break in the afternoon uh, where um, if one needs to take a nap, you can take a nap. In some monasteries, there is not a break and there is no chance to take a nap. Um, so wherever you are, accord with the conditions there. Um, it can actually be really interesting to see what happens when you go for an extended period of time with less sleep than you're used to. You may find out that it isn't a problem, or you may find out that you actually do have a limit. Um, and if you go past that limit, then your mind starts to become blurry. So uh, it is interesting to explore our relationship with sleep a bit more closely and see how much sleep do we actually need. Um, and yeah, I mean, in my own monastic life, I found that an afternoon nap is actually quite helpful. Um, other people, they find it's not necessary. Um, so it, it can vary for different people. And Mary says, you mentioned that you can be reborn months or years after death. Where are you in this period? So as well, what I said earlier is that there's different opinions and debates about whether there can be a gap between death and rebirth. Um, and I said, I'm of the opinion that it's possible. Uh, but I also specified that's not a universally accepted opinion. Um, so when we start getting into talking about the details of death and rebirth, the Buddha was relatively vague on certain things. And therefore, there's a lot of different views and opinions. So I'm always hesitant to express a view around these things because it would ultimately just be my opinion. And I usually prefer to talk about the Buddha Dhamma rather than my own opinions on things. So I think I'm actually going to skip this question because it would be getting too much into Sudaso's personal opinions rather than Buddha Dhamma. So Little Dreamer says, the bell question was more a bell significantly used in Buddhism. And is there one in the monastery? So in some branches of Vajrayana Buddhism, they put esoteric significance on specific kinds of bells. But in the rest of the Buddhist world, we don't. In the rest of the Buddhist world, bells are just bells. So we have bells. There's nothing magical about them. They're just bells. Um, they're mostly used to signal when an event is about to happen or when a meditation period is beginning or ending or when it's time to bow or, or things like that. Um, so there's not really any magical significance to it. It's, it's more a way of communicating timing uh, without using speech. And DD says, is it true that you're supposed to meditate with eyes open? This is to prevent cultivating wrong samadhi. It depends on your meditation teacher. Um, so some teachers will encourage eyes open. Some will encourage eyes closed. I encourage doing whichever you find is more helpful. So for some people, eyes closed is better. For other people, eyes open is better. It can also vary depending upon your current conditions. 
So I sometimes meditate with eyes open and sometimes with eyes closed. I actually mostly meditate with eyes open personally, but sometimes eyes closed is actually really effective. It's really helpful. So it's important to evaluate your current mental condition and whether it's going to be more helpful to have eyes open or eyes closed and watch your mind. If you notice your mind getting um, spacey or blurry or dull, then open your eyes. Um, or with eyes open, if you notice the mind is, is naturally settling into a deep stillness without losing focus, then you can try closing your eyes. And Ulysses says, why do Buddhists use bells and make sounds when they meditate? Well, I don't. Uh, I don't use bells or make sounds when I meditate. Um, I ring a bell at the end of a period of meditation to signal the group that the meditation is over, but I don't use bells during the meditation. In fact, I encourage complete silence during meditation. It makes for much stronger concentration. And Dee, Dee says, how does one get an intuitive understanding of Sankara? Is it true Nibbana can be defined as the opposite, which means the stilling of, not getting involved, not giving rise to Sankara? Okay, so Sankara is an extremely inclusive word. The Actually, the closest word in English would be thing. Sankara means thing. Anything is a Sankara. Um, and it's important to understand that that includes non-physical things, such as ideas or concepts or memories or perceptions or sensations or anything like that. Uh, so sankara, a sankara is a thing, any discrete thing which can be defined, um, and in particular defined in terms of its relationship to other things. So then nibbana is in fact the absence of things. Uh, but that isn't nothingness per se or voidness because that would be another thing. Uh, so nibbana is, is that which cannot be defined in terms of things or in terms of characteristics. And Little Dreamer asks, how is Buddhist meditation slash prayer conducted properly at specific times? Any important items needed? Scriptures recited like Satipatthana Sutta or homage to the Buddha, rituals done. It varies dramatically from monastery to monastery and tradition to tradition. So uh, Buddhist meditation, by the way, is, is one thing. Prayer is a word we don't commonly use. Um, we do talk about chanting. So I'll talk about chanting. So first off, meditation, there's many different meditation methods. Most of them involve um, either sitting still or walking in a, a specific way. Uh, and meditation is mostly about what you're doing with your mind. So it's mostly about an internal practice, not about the physical position per se. Um, as for chanting, um, then uh, specific times depends on the monastery, but commonly in the morning and in the evening. Any important items needed? Not really, but having a Buddha statue or image of the Buddha is pretty normal. Um, scriptures recited like Satipatthana Sutra, homage to the Buddha. Yeah, yeah, those both could happen. Commonly reciting homage to the Buddha or things from the suttas or... Um, sometimes later chants which have been invented, though I personally prefer to stick to what's in the suttas. Um, yeah, I mean, it really varies from monastery to monastery. It's hard to make blanket statements about these things. And Amit says, how do we find a balance between laziness and restlessness? How do we manage seeking perfection and doing work of any kind? So balance between laziness and restlessness, well, uh, watch your own mind, see what gets good benefits. When you're being too lazy, then the mind will become hazy and dull and full of, of desire and aversion. Um, and when you're putting too much energy and effort, then the mind will become tense and agitated. So if the mind is feeling tense and agitated, then relax. Um, if the mind is feeling uh, spacey and lazy and getting clogged with defilements, then put more effort. So it's this constant calibration 
of whether to relax a bit more or strive a bit more. Uh, and so we're constantly trying to adjust, um, putting on the brakes, putting on the gas, putting on the brakes, putting on the gas, like constantly trying to adjust. So it's a, it's a constant investigation, um, constant development, constant training. You say, how do we manage seeking perfection and doing work of any kind? Well, if it's not Buddhist, then it just doesn't matter, to be honest. Um, if it's not to do with the path to awakening, then it doesn't really matter whether you would, are perfect or not. It's really irrelevant. Um, just do whatever, it's fine. As long as you're not hurting anyone or whatever. Um, but when it has to do with our own practice, our own Buddhist practice, well, ultimately you just want to keep making progress towards awakening. Um, perfection is only possible for those who are fully awakened. Um, so we just want to work on getting better, uh, moving in the direction of awakening. But you don't expect perfection in your practice because it's just not going to happen until you're fully awakened. Uh, there will be no perfection. You will always be flawed. That's okay. As long as you're working on reducing the flaws and progressing towards awakening, then it's okay. Mariah asks, can you reference a few suttas that define mindfulness in the sutta so I can read them? Well, I actually recommend reading all the suttas cover to cover. It really, 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 really helps tremendously in understanding the, uh, the Buddha's teachings. If you really want to understand the Dhamma, you need to read the suttas, all of them. It really doesn't take that long and it dramatically improves uh, your practice. So read all the suttas. If you just want to read something related to mindfulness, well, the classic one is the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, but in order to really understand the Satipatthana Sutta, you need to also read all of the other suttas. And Sud says, did Buddha practice metta in directions rather than how it is usually taught nowadays, recalling yourself, friend, neutral person, enemy, etc.? So the whole self, friend, neutral, enemy thing is from the commentaries. It's not from the suttas. Uh, in the suttas, uh, actually the thing of directions is quite common. Um, so wishing, may everyone in front of me be happy, may everyone to my left be happy, to my right be happy, behind me be happy, above me be happy, below me be happy. Um, that we do see in the suttas. Uh, or north, south, east, west, up and down. Uh, we see that in the suttas. We also see more general statements of just wishing, may everyone be happy. Sabe sata sukita huntu, may everyone be happy. Um, but this thing of like um, self, friend, neutral, enemy, that's not anywhere in the suttas. That's from the, the commentarial tradition, which emerged a thousand years later. And Didi says, how does one still Sankara? Well, another meaning of Sankara is activity. So stilling Sankara means stop all activities of body and mind. Hold body and mind completely still. Stop all activities of body and mind. And Madame Zeroni says, I'm very busy and find it hard to have time to practice kindness, precepts and dana. Do you have any advice? You always have time to practice kindness, always. You can keep the precepts, but in every moment, practice kindness. Every sentient being that comes in front of you, be kind to them, be gentle, be friendly. Even if you're really busy, you can still be kind. As for Donna, look for opportunities to be kind to others, to give things to others, to share what you have with others. Even if you're busy, you can share. So Floral says, what is the difference between mantra and chanting and puja? So a mantra is usually a phrase um, which is repeated over and over. Um, probably the most famous Buddhist mantra is from uh, the Tibetan tradition, Om Mani Padme Hung. Um, there's many, many others, but that's one which is very famous for some reason. Um, so usually in mantra practice, you would just repeat that one phrase over and over again. Whereas with chanting, you might be chanting um, 
entire discourses or sections of discourses. Um, so rather than just repeating one phrase, you might be chanting many pages of material. Um, so it's it's actually quite different in that respect. And mantra chanting is is more a form of meditation in that it's um, getting the mind to do only one thing. Uh, so just repeating the one phrase. So that makes the mind very quiet because it's not doing anything except the mantra. Um, chanting is more about recollecting the Dhamma, recollecting the Buddhist teachings. Um, so bringing the mind to focus on the teachings of the Buddha. So a little bit different, though the effect can be somewhat similar. And Mariah says, if I practice tranquility, can this eventually lead to insight or do I need to practice insight in isolation as a separate method or technique? Well, a classic sutta on this is the Yuganadda Sutta, in which the Buddhist uh, describes three main approaches. Uh, one is to first practice samatha, uh, tranquility, and then afterwards practice vipassana, insight. So first samatha, then vipassana. Second one is to do first vipassana, then samatha. And the third one is to develop both simultaneously. Um, so all three of those are valid ways of practicing. Um, I usually emphasize the first and the third. So either to start with samatha, and when the mind is, is very peaceful and stable, then to practice uh, vipassana, um, or to practice both simultaneously. Um, but there are some teachers which emphasize first vipassana, and then once you develop some skill with vipassana, then you practice samatha in order to deepen and strengthen your vipassana practice. Um, these days, there's also teachers who teach only vipassana and no samatha, but there's no basis for that in the suttas, so I don't, I don't talk about that at all. Um, it's quite clear in the suttas you need both samatha and vipassana, but the order you do them in or whether you do them separately or simultaneously, that's up to you. Uh, it can work either way. A lot of questions today. So Madame Zeroni says, I have less time to practice generosity. It brought me lots of happiness, but now I feel less since I don't have much time to practice. Any advice to keep my dana practice going or to keep that happiness in my life? Well, look for opportunities to practice generosity. Um, rejoice in the opportunities that you do have. And also constantly remember the good things you've done in the past. And also recognize that you do want to do more. It's just that your current life conditions are limiting. So also focus on that pure intention and make it really strong, the intention that when I do have the opportunity again, I will take the opportunity. And Didi says, as a beginner, how does one get a very intuitive and practical application to start seeing Petita Samupada for the arising phenomena as they're experiencing? As a beginner, you don't. That's not a beginner thing. That's an advanced thing. As a beginner, you should just be trying to pay attention to your body. Like seeing Petita Samupada, I mean, let's be realistic. If you don't have strong mindfulness and concentration, you're not going to be seeing anything. Um, let alone the kind of refined thing that you're talking about. So start with developing very strong mindfulness, very strong concentration, very stable equanimity. And with that basis, once the mind is extremely stable and sharp and clear, then observe impermanence. Uh, observe the insubstantial, constantly changing nature of all phenomena. Uh, then you'll start to see Paticca Samuppada. Then it will happen naturally. But without strong mindfulness and strong concentration um, paired with equanimity, it's just not going to happen. Don't get ahead of yourself. Ulysses asks, what chants are good to say when meditating and venerating the Buddha to keep focus? Um, ideally, nothing. Ideally, let your mind be completely silent. That's best. Uh, but if you want to use some kind of repetition, I mean, you have lots of options. Um, one of the classics is Namo Buddhaya, which just means homage to the Buddha. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. Uh, that's a, an old classic. Um, but it, it's actually better just to let your mind be completely silent.
So Manuel says, lately I've had occasional intrusive thoughts of abruptly losing another beloved family member, and I'm not sure how to process this. Well, the fact is that you're going to lose all of your family members. That's the nature of samsara. You're going to lose everyone you love, all of them. The Buddha said we should reflect on this every single day. Um, it's one of the five recollections. One of them is uh, recollecting that everything that is dear to us will be lost to us. Everything we love is changing and we will be separated from it. Uh, includes all of our all of our beloved people in our life. We're going to lose every single one of them. And we need to remind ourselves of that every single day. Uh, so it's actually good that these thoughts are arising in your mind because it's a reminder that you should be recollecting this and recollecting it with equanimity because this is the nature of reality and we need to come to terms with it. Uh, nobody that's in our life will be there forever. We will lose every single one of them. And that's not a problem. It's just the way reality works. Um, so this is a very important part of our practice. And Samir asks, is craving a symptom of our sense of a separate self? I.e., can we only crave if there's the illusion of a craver? That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Um, desire arises directly from self-identity. Yeah. And Mariah asks, oh, they say, I'm reading the Majjhima right now, but I just started, so it might take me a long time. Yeah, keep going. It actually doesn't take that long if you read one sutta a day, which is very minimal. If you read one sutta a day, you'll get through all of it in five months. It's actually quite minimal. And then you can read through the Samyutta, the Ingutra, the Diga, and you'll be through all of it in less than two years. And that's only reading a few minutes a day. So it's quite doable. Now, if you read more, then you'll get through all of it in a year or less. It's very doable. And Little Dreamer says, does Empty Cloud do anything special on Buddhist holidays? If so, what are those holidays and festivities? So we do celebrate a handful of Buddhist holidays. Um, so we do Vesak, which is the day of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death. And that's usually in May, I believe, full moon of May. Um, uh, we do... Uh, Katina, uh, which is the end of the Vasa, the end of the summer retreat. Uh, so that's a celebration of, of Sangha, the celebration of having monastic communities in the world. Um, do we do any other holidays? Vesak and Katina, do we do anything else? I don't think so. We're actually pretty light on holidays here. We're not really big on holidays. Um, there's more Buddhist holidays. We just don't do most of them because those, the two I just mentioned are the big ones, Vesak and Katina. Those are the big ones. There's a bunch of minor ones that we don't, we don't actually celebrate here. Um, we're pretty boring as a monastery, I have to say. Um, and Didi says, does that mean resting in awareness slash vast spacious awareness equals stilling Sankara? Every time mental phenomena arise, you notice it, relax, and let go of it. That's an aspect of stillings and cars, yes. Yeah. Yep. Ulysses says, how can our minds stay in the present, in the now? Technically, they're never anywhere else. Our minds are always in the present. Um, but when you notice yourself thinking of past or future, just recognize that you're thinking of past and future and stop. Now bring your attention back to focusing on your body. Focus on feeling the sensation of your body. That's always in the present moment. And Mariah says, do you think gatas are helpful and skillful? I was reading some written by Thich Nhat Hanh, and I am considering using these during my day. Can this be supportive of wholesome qualities? They can be. Yeah, they can be. Um, some of them are really good, actually really good recollections and contemplations, which can help to focus the mind on wholesome states. Um, yeah, those can be useful. And Sud says, on days when I can't do enough formal sitting due to time constraints, I try to develop metta while engaged in activity. 
as part of deliberate intention. Does this still count as meditation or what is meant by the Pali word bhavana? Yes, that does count under bhavana, but it is not a substitute for formal meditation. It's better than nothing, and it is still bhavana, but formal meditation is irreplaceable. There's no substitute for it. Um, so what you're doing is still good, but it's not a substitute for formal meditation. There is no substitute. And Maria says, when you say samatha, then vipassana, do you mean within the same meditation session? Or do you mean spend years doing one before moving to the next? Either way is fine. Um, so it can be during one meditation session. So you might do samatha for 20 minutes and then vipassana for 20 minutes. That's fine. Um, or you might focus on just doing samatha for a couple of years. Uh, and then when you feel your mindfulness and concentration are very strong, then you might start incorporating insight into your practice. That's also fine. It's really about doing whatever works. Um, and also being realistic that for most of our life, our meditation is going to be pretty bad. For most of our life, we're not going to be very good at meditating. That's okay. The important thing is that we keep practicing. So if you want to do samatha for a while and you're like, well, my samatha is still pretty weak, but I want to practice vipassana, well, that's okay. Then do some vipassana. Um, no problem. Uh, and then get back to doing some more samatha, build it up, build it up, and do some more vipassana, work on that, work on that, do some more samatha, work on that, work on that, just keep building it up. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fine. Either way is fine. And Lucky Gamer Lewis says, how literally should Deacon Akaya 26 be taken? I don't remember Deacon Akaya 26 off the top of my head. Um, general rule, by the way, when referencing suttas, it's better to give me the name of the sutta in Pali, if possible. Um, numbers I usually don't remember, but names I remember. So DN26, namely, tells a story where in the golden age of a world system, a person's lifespan is 80,000 and will eventually decline to 10 years. Sounds like Hindu thought. Um, well, I can't comment on whether or not it sounds like Hindu thought. Uh, I can say that what the Buddha is describing is how the human lifespan is not always 100 years. Like these days, the human lifespan is roughly 100 years, assuming someone has really good health. But the Buddha is saying it's not always that way. Um, sometimes, under certain conditions, humans live much longer lives. And other times they live much shorter lives. So I would, I would actually take it more or less literally in that sense that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends upon the particular conditions that one is born into. If you have good karma, the karma of longevity, you might be born into a time and place where humans live for centuries or even millennia. Um, and if your longevity karma is not so good, you might be born into an era where humans only live 10 or 20 years. So I actually take that at face value. And Little Dreamer says, is there a class system for those who join the Sangha or is everyone seen as equals? For example, a hierarchy like lowest is deacon and highest is the Pope. So we don't have something like the Catholic hierarchy that you're referring to. So there's no such thing as deacons and popes in Buddhism, um, at least not in the system the Buddha created. So the system the Buddha created, in theory, every monk is equal, but we also have a sense of respect for seniority. So senior monks do not have more power or more authority than junior monks, but we do respect them. We respect the many years that they spent uh, in monastic life. Um, and we do, generally speaking, we give them, um, we give preference to them when it comes to things like distributing uh, robes and food and, and lodgings and so on. We usually give preference to more senior monks, um, but they don't have power and authority in the way that, say, the Pope has in Catholicism. So this is according to the system the Buddha created. Um, that said, in every Buddhist country, there have developed 
um, political structures for controlling Buddhism. And those political structures sometimes resemble the kind of power hierarchy that you're referring to, but it doesn't have anything to do with the Buddhist teaching. So I'm not talking about that. And Parinaz asks, are there specific suggestions for meditation to transform a divided mind perception? I have no idea what divided mind perception is. So Parinaz, you'll need to define divided mind perception for me to be able to answer that. And Didi says, last question, we'll see. <laughs> if the prerequisite of having right view is Yoniso Manasikara, what is Yoniso Manasikara? And can you provide examples that one starts to develop this way of seeing? Well, if you want me to talk about the literal meaning of the word Yoniso Manasikara, we'll be here for a little while. Uh, briefly speaking, Yoniso Manasikara literally means mm, paying attention to causality. That's the literal meaning of the word. You'll usually see it translated as wise attention, um, but that's actually quite an inventive translation. The literal meaning is paying attention to causality. Paying attention to origination would be even more literal. So it means observing the um, causal conditions for the arising of phenomena. And when the Buddha defines Yonasal Manasikara in the suttas, he normally talks about observing the Four Noble Truths. So Yoniso Manasikara is paying attention to the Four Noble Truths, noticing how Dukkha arises, noticing what causes Dukkha to arise, noticing how Dukkha ceases, noticing what causes Dukkha to cease, noticing what actions and behaviors lead to either increasing or decreasing Dukkha. Um, that's Yoniso Manasikara. So it's the observation of the direct experience of the Four Noble Truths. Okay. And Sergio says, I was reading today the Relay Chariot Sutta, good sutta, which mentions the seven purifications. Bhikkhu Bodhi has a footnote stating that it is curious that they are not analyzed as a set anywhere in the Nikayas. Is it known that this forms the basis for the Vasudhimagga? Do you think that the Vasudhimagga's explanation is satisfactory? I don't think the Vasudhimagga is satisfactory for anything. And I don't recommend reading it. Um, Ulysses asks, is it okay if I have a Buddha statue next to my Catholic statues? Yes, no problem. Yep. Um, Vice versa, it's also fine to have Catholic statues next to your Buddhist statues. Um, I know actually, I know a lot of Buddhist people who have statues of St. Mary um, next to the Buddha. I think that's fine. Actually, I would personally do that here without the slightest hesitation or problem. Um, I actually wouldn't mind having images from uh, many different religions and spiritual traditions next to the Buddha. Uh, as long as there are icons that represent something wholesome and good, then there's no problem. And Rick says, a family member in his 30s has depression to the level that he cannot see a reason to get up out of bed. Do you have any suggestions from the Buddhist path that might be helpful? Um, if they're not Buddhist, then no, I don't have any advice from the Buddhist path. If they're not Buddhist, they need to go to a doctor as soon as possible um, and do whatever the doctor tells them to do. Um, if somebody is Buddhist, then Buddhist practice can help with these sorts of things. If they're not Buddhist, then there's no point in referencing things from Buddhism. Um, just have them go to a doctor, have them go to a psychiatrist, have them go to a therapist. Um, but me giving Buddhist advice to a non-Buddhist person success rate is close to zero. I wouldn't recommend going that route. It's not really relevant. Samir says, can you elaborate on the nature of emptiness, shunyata? Yes. Briefly speaking, nothing can be described as either existent or non-existent. Things appear to exist under certain conditions and appear to not exist under other conditions. Uh, but they cannot themselves be described as existing or as not existing. That is emptiness. 
It's one way of approaching emptiness anyway. And Don says, can you share some more causes for future benefits? I have certain things like if you want to be beautiful, quell anger. If you want wealth, be generous. If you want longevity, don't kill, etc." Yeah, that's from the suttas. Um, I don't remember the name of the sutta off the top of my head. I think it's Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta, the lesser analysis of kamma, lesser analysis of, of karma, of action. Um, that gives a number of examples, like the ones that you mentioned. Um, but generally speaking, the Buddha actually didn't go into detail. Uh, he just gave general statements like uh, good deeds, deeds based upon wholesome motivations will produce pleasant results. Uh, bad deeds based upon unwholesome motivations will produce painful results. Generally speaking, the Buddha just gave more general statements like that. Um, but the Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta might be what you're looking for. It's from the Majjhima Nikaya, I don't remember the number, um, lesser analysis of karma. Little Dreamer says, thank you for answering all my questions. Happy to help. I actually quite like answering questions. Let's see. Celestino says, my main focus is to always have a mind in peace. Any thought coming to disturb that peace is seen as dangerous. And I stop evaluating its origin and seeing it's anicca anatta. Is it a mind in peace, the right path? That sounds pretty good. What you're doing sounds pretty good. Yeah. Prayana says, I will have to reformulate my question later, but I was specifically thinking about female versus male gaze. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, Parinas, you'll need to explain. I, I really don't understand what you're asking about. And S asks, is eating fried food bad for meditation? Not in my experience. Um, do monks eat fried food? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've noticed a lot of people have this idea that certain foods will make your meditation bad. Um, but that really hasn't been my experience. Um, yeah, I, I've never found any correlation between fried food and bad meditation. Generally speaking, as long as you're eating a fairly healthy, balanced diet, then it won't affect your meditation practice. And Oknik Sahil says, I want to do 12 hours study, but something's stopping me and I do six hours, how to push over self. Uh, I can't help you to be honest. I mean, first off, are we talking study of Buddhism or are we talking something else? Um, second, it's up to you to figure out how to motivate yourself. So if you want to do 12 hours, that's, a nice motivation, nice goal, I guess. Um, but it's up to you to decide if that's actually a realistic goal and how to motivate yourself. And Amit says, how do we understand perception as a kanda? So here I assume you mean sanya. So sanya, uh, I actually prefer to translate it as recognition or as identification. So sanya is the mental process of identifying sensory experiences. Uh, usually it takes the form of labeling something. Like you have a visual experience and you label it cat. Uh, or you have an auditory experience and you label it wind. Uh, so sanya is that process of identifying something, of recognizing what something is. And Moraya says, did the, did the Buddha ever teach to use visualizing during meditation? I find holding visual images in mind helps me feel calm and stay focused. Is this outside of Buddhist meditation? Well, um, there are a number of things we find in the suttas which do seem to be visualization, but it's very specific usages. Um, generally speaking, most of the practices that we find in the suttas are about 
mindfulness-based direct experience um, rather than about visualization. Uh, there were also things about contemplating specific ideas or themes, but that also doesn't necessarily involve visualizing. So um, that said, it can be useful, but generally speaking, I really recommend using mindfulness of the body as the basis of your practice. One of the big dangers with using visual images as the basis is that it can easily lead towards daydreaming and spaciness. Uh, so uh, it's very important to watch out for that potential downfall. Whereas focusing on mindfulness of the body does not carry that risk. So let's see, Samir says, the Asta Sahasrika Sutra, um, the discourse of the eight, Thousand. I assume that's um, Prajnaparamita and 8,000 lines. I assume that's the one you're talking about. It says, the Buddha was not stationed in the realm which is free from conditions, nor in the things which are under conditions, but freely he wandered without a home. Please explain. Oh, boy. Uh, so the important line here is, uh, wandered without a home. So what this means is that the a fully awakened being's mind is not stuck anywhere. That's what it means. Uh, it's not stuck anywhere, and it isn't fixated on anything in particular. That's what that means. And Shadow of Label says, is there an internal alchemy of spirituality? I have no idea what that means. In Buddhism, like there is in Taoism, I don't know Taoism, where a person can control their spiritual power. And it really depends what you mean by spiritual power. So there's, yeah, there's, you'd have to define all of those terms before I could even hope to start answering your question. Um, as it currently sounds from what you're saying, I'd have to say probably not. And Sud says, I have difficulty practicing metta when I get extremely busy in activity. Do you have any advice as to how one can motivate oneself to practice metta during these moments? Practice metta during all the other moments. That's the most important thing. Practice metta the rest of the time. And then during the difficult times, it will come more naturally to you. And especially if you're about to go into a difficult situation, then really focus on building up very strong metta beforehand so that your mind is already saturated with metta when you're entering the difficult conditions. And Shadow of Label asks, where does one start with Buddhism when Taoism and Buddhism are so intertwined in Chinese Buddhism when studying Chinese Buddhism? Well, you start by reading the suttas. Uh, read the Pali Canon cover to cover, uh, Sutta Pitika cover to cover. Um, then when you look at Chinese Buddhism, then you'll see what is in accordance with that and what is something different. And Rick says, Bhante, can you share some reflections on ways we can let go of the life and possessions we have developed as illness and aging lead us into a more diminished stage of life? I have a difficult time trying to decide what I might still need or want. Bare minimum. That's the important guideline. What is the bare minimum, the absolute minimum necessary? And it's always lower than you think it is. Ask yourself, what is the actual bare minimum? Everything else is unnecessary. Everything else is excess and can easily be let go of. But yeah, keep in mind, the bare minimum is always much lower than we think. It's part of the value of monastic life is it helps us to strip away a lot of the unnecessary things. Mariah says, if people stay at empty cloud for a week or two, do you offer meditation instruction? Yes, yes. Shadow of Label asks, what is the point of celibacy? I have been celibate for months and experienced nothing. Well, 
The point of celibacy is to diminish your desire. That's the point. So you said you've been celibate for months. Great. Say you've experienced nothing. Okay. Good for you. Great. May you continue to experience nothing. That's the last question online. Um, anything? Yeah, go ahead. So the other day, Bhante, you were talking about the Maha Namana Sutra, and um, the advice was the advice to um, Maha Namana. Maha Nama. Maha Nama was to recollect like some recollect the triple gem and some other things. So how can we practice recollecting recollecting the devas? Recollecting the devas. Uh, well, in the suttas, the definition the Buddha gives is to, first off, to remember the different kinds of devas. So he gives a list of the um, deva realms. Uh, specifically, he goes through the list of all of the um, kama loka deva worlds. Um, so all of the lower, the sensual deva worlds, which are the ones which are the most similar to humans, and therefore the easiest to recollect. And then above that, he just mentions the Brahma devas and then the devas higher than that, but he doesn't list them. And, and again, I think this is because the lower deva realms are more human-like and therefore easier for us to be aware of. So first is actually calling to mind what are devas, uh, what are the characteristics of the devas, recollecting the um, happy and pleasant and joyful lives that they live. Uh, I'm getting happy just thinking about it. This is cool. Uh, so thinking about the devas, thinking about uh, what wonderful, magical lives they live, and thinking like, oh, and what did they do in order to become devas? Oh, they cultivated good karma. They cultivated morality and generosity and patience and peacefulness. Um, I also have cultivated those qualities. I also have put a lot of practice into building up exactly that same karma. So I have within me the potential to be born as a deva. Uh, so this is how the Buddha taught to do a recollection of the devas. Okay. And there's a, some more questions online. So Little Dreamer says, were you raised in this religion or did you convert? I was not raised Buddhist. Uh, I became Buddhist at the age of 17. Um, what is your favorite part of running the monastery and meeting all new occupants? Seems like two different questions. Favorite part of running the monastery, solitude. Um, my favorite part of running the monastery, I actually don't like running monasteries. I like sitting alone in my room. That's actually what I like. Um, meeting all new occupants, I actually prefer not to. I prefer to sit alone in my room, actually. Um, uh, meeting people is part of my metta practice. But I would actually much rather just be alone in my room. Let's see. Okay. And it looks like that's the last question. So thank you for all your wonderful questions. It was really delightful to have so many wonderful questions and um, don't be shy. Those of you who asked many questions, it's no problem. The more questions, the better. So I think we'll go ahead and conclude at this time with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we'll see you all next time.